My next speaker, our next speaker, which I am very privileged and honored to announce and introduce, is a lawyer, an educator, a counselor, a preacher, a philanthropist, and an excellent homemaker. She is the first lady of the Lighthouse Chapel International, a denomination with over 3,000 satellites across all continents of the world. Before being dedicated to the ministry, she served faithfully for many years as a state attorney in the Attorney General's Office of Ghana. Madame or Lady Reverend Adelaide Howard Mills has a remarkable reputation as a peacemaker in her speech and demeanor, which you will see very soon. Can I have a round of applause for our next speaker? Hallelujah. I know it's after lunch and you are feeling a bit slow. Please take your seat. But um, because even before I said you should take your seat, majority of you were sitting down. But um, I want you to give a resounding applause to Jesus. Amen. Let all the tired hands clap. Those at the back, those in the middle, those in front. He deserves all the honor, the choir. Put your hands together. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for this time. Your word says, unto you shall the gathering of the people be. Speak to our hearts. Let your word fall on good ground. Let it yield much fruit. Let it not just be a social event, but let it be an encounter with you. Use this vessel of clay, anoint this vessel of clay, fill this vessel of clay with your Holy Spirit, and grant me utterance as of the oracles of God. Thank you for your grace and your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'm glad to be here at your... Women in Charge Conference, and um, just being at the tail end of uh, Madame Charlotte Osei's rendition, I gleaned a lot. So if you have been here since morning, then I hope that you have gleaned a lot from God, from his word, and that light has come into your life. Amen. And that, um, like I said, it hasn't just been a, a social event. But before I speak about anything, I want to recognize the First Lady of Pleasant Places, <laughs> Mama Titi Ofer, they say. Some people call me Mama Dag, so. And uh, we want to thank you also for the vision because you could have been doing anything else this Saturday morning. But Lady Olivia decided we needed to be in God's presence and she has obeyed that and for that we are very grateful. So God bless you. Give you more grace to overcome every battle and to prevail. And I also want to salute the Bishop of the House, who actually was the one who sent me WhatsApp and engaged me. And I thought, wow, this is so great in the way he's supporting his wife in this endeavor. And may he continue and get better and better. Amen. <laughs> Pastors are very special to me. I don't know, I have a soft spot for them. So, um, Bishop Titi Ofe, wherever you are, 
Thank you for this conference. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for giving us a slot on your church calendar because I know pastors are very busy and sometimes even you think we are an abstraction. So thank you for not thinking we are an abstraction but for including us. Amen. Well, I was given a mandate that I should speak on the making of a godly home, the role of prayer, the making of a godly home, and the role of prayer. Now, what is a home? I would say that a home is not always made up of um, a perfect nuclear family. In fact, when I looked up the dictionary definition of a home, it said a place of residence, a place where you live. That was the first definition. And then going on, it said a social unit formed by a family living together. And like there's an expression, trying to make a good home for children. Or they'll say somebody's from a loving home. But a loving home doesn't mean you always have all the components. Is it working? It doesn't mean you always have all the component, components of it. Some of us may come from a home where maybe we lost our mother, a home where there's no father, a home where maybe it was made a home for us by our grandparents, but all in all, it's still a home. Amen? And we thank God for that. Now, a godly home. When we look at Psalm 127, verse 1, the Bible says, and I'm reading from, um, I'm reading from King James for this, but. Except the Lord build the house, some verses say build a home. They labor in vain that build it. Amen? Except the Lord build the house or the home where you are. Whatever you are doing is going to be in vain. Now, some people may think, oh, a home is where you have all the comforts of life. But if you have all the comforts of life and Christ is not there... You are going to build a home, but it's not a godly home. Amen? And it doesn't necessarily connote happiness or peace or joy or understanding. Amen? So we should allow God to be the one who builds our home for us, not ourselves. And if God is going to build a home, he's going to build it on his word and he's going to build it on his presence his word connotes his presence because the bible says in the beginning was the word john 1 and the word was with god and the word was actually god amen and then we say except the lord build the house if god doesn't build the house but right? if god is going to build a house he's going to build it on his word Lady Reverend, how do you know? Because the Bible says about the man who built on the sand and the one who built on the rock that they all built. And all the houses looked the same. But it was when the wind came, the Bible says the floods came down, the winds blew vehemently, and the storm beat the house, both houses. But at the end of the storm, which you've just heard, a storm, you've heard about a storm. At the head of the storm, one house stood and one was completely devastated. The difference is not the storm. The difference is the foundation. Amen, somebody. The wise man built his house on the rock, which Jesus told us that rock is the word of God and that rock is me. Amen. We used to have a popular saying, Christ is the, uh, the listener to every conversation, the unseen guest at every meal. But in a godly home, Christ must be seen. He's not supposed to be an, the silent listener to every conversation. 
Christ must be seen in a godly home. So I beg to differ on that nice plaque on your wall that he's the unseen guest. Maybe you try to say physically he's unseen, but spiritually we must see Christ in the home because that is a godly home. Amen? So first of all, a godly home must be built on Christ. A godly home must be built on Christ. And that means you are going to build on his word. Then when we look at Proverbs 14 verse 1, we probably would see our role in building a home. The New Living Translation says, A wise woman builds her home, but a foolish woman tears it down with her own hands. Proverbs 14 verse 1. Another version says, Homes are made by the wisdom of women, but destroyed by their foolishness. Amen? So in building a godly home, you have to decide, are you going to be a wise woman or are you going to be a foolish woman? Now, the, the, Bible, uh, the world's um, definition of wise and foolish is not God's definition. So when you look at the parable I just talked about, where the storms came and beat vehemently, the wise person was the one who built his house, his home, on the rock. Amen. And the second one or the other one was the foolish man or woman who built his wife, his home on sand. Sand means things that don't last. Sand means you cannot build your home on lipstick. You cannot build your home on makeup. You cannot build your home on the latest lace. You cannot even build your home on money. Though money is good and money is helpful. Amen, somebody. You cannot build your home on a man. You cannot build your home on a human being. That, oh, my husband is alive and everything is okay, so it's a good home. No. The only person who never dies, who never leaves you nor forsakes you is Christ. He says heaven and earth will pass away. But my word, my word, invest in the word. Let the word of God matter to you. When we look in your wardrobe, we see all the beautiful things, but we don't see anything related to the word. When we look on your iPad, we don't see any hunger for the word and for the things of God. We don't see any material that is spiritual that you are building on. But today, let there be a difference. Prioritize. Amen. You see, when you see people out there, everybody looks smart, everybody looks good, everybody looks as if they don't have a problem, okay? But there's no life without a problem. And the only way we can survive the storm, I love Jesus because he's not like your former boyfriend who told you so many lies and so many promises. Jesus will tell you as it is, that build on the rock, that rock is my word. When you build on the rock, I'm not saying you will not have storms, but I say that after the storm, you will still be standing. Amen. And I'm not speaking just to married people. I am speaking to the unmarried also, because you are going to build a home. And how you do that through prayer is something I'll be coming to presently. Now, you say that, oh, lady, remember, I'm not married, I'm not building a home. Really? You start building before the marriage. You know, in tree, we say, orkwaware, orkwaware, well, that's fancy. Orkwaware. So the idea is that a war is like this room, and that when you enter, you have entered the aware. But I have news for you. The warrior is not there. It's you who is coming to build and bring building materials. For that warrior you are thinking about. So don't think that you are going for a marriage that is already there. No, it's not like that. It's what you build with. What are the materials you are going to build with? It's not enough to build a godly home on love. There's a book that says marriage takes more than love. If it's godly love, yes, it's going to 
be a part of it. But that's not all that God's word is about. But most of you, when you build, when you think about a godly home, you say, <laughs> my husband will wake me up and then we'll have quiet time together. Sir, you are having a lot of dreams. Look, you have to know God for yourself. And there are times when your husband may not be there. He's gone for a crusade. He's gone. Here. So if he's not there, how what material will you build on? If everything spiritual depends on the man, beloved, you are doomed. Because you must know how to hold the hem of his garments. You must know how to love Jesus and to know him. And Jesus doesn't make it difficult to know him. You know, when I was... When I entered Lagon many years ago, maybe, by the grace of God, I'm now about 32 years at the bar. But at that time, they took only 40 people to read law. Okay? And nowadays you have 500 and then you are complaining. Anyway. They took 40. So when you came into the university in first year, you had great grades and you came in. But after the first year, your, your grades didn't matter. They were now looking for only 40 people who were the top 40. And then they would take those people to be full-fledged lawyers who do only law subjects. Do you understand? To the end, LLB. And then you become a barrister at law. Now look at how man is able to exclude people from certain places. But God is not like that. He doesn't exclude you from being part of him. He doesn't exclude you from having access to him. God is not like that, but it depends on you. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, it depends on you. So you have to decide that you are going to be a wise woman who builds her home. The foolish one also works, but she tears it down. Some people build and some people demolish, but demolition is also work. And when you go and call people to demolish your house, you pay. That's one of the most amazing things to me. I felt that demolition is spoiling, so you don't... You pay through your nose. Amen. So don't be a demolisher. Be a builder. Build your home on God. Amen. Now, Proverbs 24, 3 says, Through wisdom, the home is built. Okay, Amplify says, Through skillful and godly wisdom is a house, a life, a home, a family built. And by understanding, it is established on a sound and good foundation. And by knowledge shall its chambers of every area be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Amen. Through skillful and godly wisdom, a life, a home, a family is built. It's not built through money, though money is good. It's not built through just financial breakthroughs. It's not built through educational degrees. Amen, somebody? All the education is good. But it is built through wisdom. Through wisdom, a house is built. A home, a life, a foundation. Now, you can't just build without wisdom if you are going to build a home. The Bible is saying you need wisdom. Then the same Bible comes to say in James 1.5, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth liberally and upbraided not. So the wisdom to build that house comes from God. Now to access that wisdom, you must ask, which brings you to your prayer life. Amen? So you will need prayer in order to build a godly home. And the Bible, I was saying that you should build on the word of God. The word of God says, among other things, pray without season. Amen? And has a lot to say about prayer. So even for wisdom to build that godly home, it is going to come through prayer. Because it says that if any man lack wisdom, unfortunately, a lot of people who lack wisdom don't know. You know, when something is wrong with you, you don't know. It's, it's worse than if you know. When you go to the hospital, they say they can't find what is wrong with you. It's not as 
as settling us when they say it's malaria, it's this, and we, we, we know what to do. So sometimes you don't have wisdom, but you don't know that you should go and ask God. But God is the repository of all wisdom. And God's wisdom is not earthly wisdom. Amen. So we build also a godly home by asking God for wisdom. Now some of you may be saying, well, I have wisdom because I'm educated. Look, the wisdom of this world, the Bible says in the book of James, is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Amen. But the wisdom that comes from above, the Bible defines is peaceable, is pure, is easy to be entreated, is without partiality. That's what the Bible says. So if you are going to build your house by wisdom, that your home, that the Bible says is built by, you have to renew your mind. Amen? And think like God thinks. And then when you look at the things, you will see that you used to think you were wise. But after reading, you have come to see that you are not as wise as you thought. Amen? So a godly home <laughs> is going to be built by wisdom. Amen. It says that the wisdom that comes from above is different from the wisdom that comes from beneath. So you may go to your mother and go and say, Mommy, I'm having a lot of problems in my marriage and uh, I don't know what to do. Then she will start to quote you African Proverbs. Amen. And the African Proverbs make sense. So you'll be listening to it and saying, my mother is very wise. <laughs> But what it is is that you lack wisdom, so you don't know. Amen? And I think I should quote it so. James chapter 3, verse 15. Maybe from verse 14. James chapter 3, 13. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation, that's your behavior, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Verse 15. This wisdom, this wisdom, that's the earthly one, descends not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. Amen? So if a godly home is built by wisdom, like the Bible is saying, by wisdom a house is built, and then you go and collect this earthly wisdom. That's not what the Bible is talking about. It's talking about the wisdom that comes from above. So verse 16 says, For where there is envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. You know the works of Satan when there is confusion and every evil work in the home. Probably the wisdom that comes from above is not operating. But when you look at 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure. Pure. The decisions you are taking, the things you are doing in your home, the conclusions you are coming to, is it pure? It's first of all pure. Then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Amen. Why am I going to all the wisdom things? Because the Bible says in James 1 5, if any man lack wisdom. So when you look at this thing, you see that you are not pure. You are not easily to be entreated. When something is happening and then you feel you are right. When something is happening and you feel you are right, that's it. It's not going to change. But the wisdom from above is not like that. And thank God we can ask him for wisdom in building our homes. Amen. Now, who are the members in the home? It can be the extended family. It can be with your husband, children, 
mother, um, adoptees, um, domestic staff, all of them make up your home. So now, Lady Reverend, how do we build these homes by prayer? We have to invite God into our lives and into our homes. God is not an armed robber who breaks the door and comes in. He wants you to give him access to your life. And when you do that, then he can come in. Amen. Proverbs 3 says, In all your ways, acknowledge him. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not to your own understanding. A lot of us lean to our own understanding. A lot of us lean to our own experiences we had in the world. But the Bible says, trust in the Lord. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, including the making of a home, acknowledge him. We acknowledge him by prayer. Amen, ladies. And he shall direct your paths. Amen. So prayer is how we start to build a godly home. Now when you look in the Bible, many, many, many people, including mothers, came to Jesus. The Syrophoenician woman, she had a problem with one of her children. She said, help me, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Some of us, we don't even want to agree that your child is vexed with the devil. And if it is said, it will be a problem because you don't want to say it. But this woman came to Jesus and said, help me, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. It was a prayer. And Jesus gave her a lot of excuses. I'm not called to you. I can't give the bread of the children to dogs. I can't do this. I, but the woman persisted. Said, truth, Lord. But even the dogs, they eat from the crumbs that fall from the table. She pursued Jesus in prayer till her child, who was not physically with her, was healed. And then Jesus said, wow, I've never seen such faith in the whole of Israel. So a godly home is built by prayer, but also by prayer which moves by faith. Amen, somebody. Faith in God. Faith that no matter how devastating or how terrible the situation is, God can bring you home. God can bring you out. God can save that wayward child. This girl is vexed with a demon. And I think that she must have been at the height of it. So the mother could not bring her to Jesus. She had to come on her own as a point of contact. And Jesus met her. All these things happen in the home. Amen. Jairus' daughter was sick. And he said, Jesus, you don't need to come. Just speak the word. And my daughter will be healed. The mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, she came to Jesus and she said, please, Grant that my children will sit on the left and on the right. All that was prayer. And Jesus said, really? Are they prepared to drink the cup that I drink? And it's significant that it's women. Of course, there are some men too, but women bring their children to Jesus. Even from babyhood, you know, they brought the children. And it is the Ogbontia men who said, you are disturbing Jesus. We are not doing children's ministry here. We are doing serious things here. And Jesus saw it and said, Peter, stand aside. Suffer the little children. Permit them to come unto me. Who brought them? Mothers. We have to show that he will lay his hands on them. We need prayer to build godly homes. Amen. If we don't see the need for prayer, the need for the master's touch is not going to happen. Beloved, homes are made by the wisdom of women, but it's also destroyed by their foolishness. And it is wise to bring everything to God in prayer. 
including children who have been vexed by demons, and including children that it looks like Jesus is busy and he just has to talk, and including bringing children that disciples are sending away, but you, the mother of the home, you are pressing on so that the child will receive a touch from the Lord. Amen. Now I'm going to give you some nuggets for prayer. Some nuggets for prayer. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his window being opened in his chamber towards Jerusalem. He kneeled down upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did a fourth time. Amen. Anyone who is too busy to pray is too busy. Daniel was a prime minister, and yet he was able to go to his home and have a prayer altar in his home and cry unto God three times a day. Amen. So your home is not just for entertainment, to bring people to be happy. Every day you are wearing white. Every day is a birthday. Your home is an altar of prayer. Daniel would come home three times a day and kneel and pray to God. Amen. So the point is, the first point is that if you are too busy to pray, then you are too busy. Many times when people become prosperous, they stop going for prayer meetings and they eventually backslide. Amen? Not so with Daniel. He was a prime minister of his country, second in authority only to the king. He was a successful man who had risen from slavery to the high office of prime minister. He was one of the most respected and feared men in the nation. He was a major politician, yet he prayed three times a day, every day. Amen. What were some of the principles that guided Daniel? Beloved, it is more important to know how to pray than to have degrees like the thermometer. When Satan comes knocking on your door, it's not whether your degrees make two sentences. It is whether you are calling on the God you know. That's what makes a difference. Many times, or sometimes, especially when my children were younger, my husband has gone on crusades, and the child is sick, the child is running a temperature, or something has happened. One time I'd even been given a diagnosis for one of the children, which they said they were now going to cross-check. I was calling my husband. He was speaking on the podium, so he couldn't reach me. I was so distressed. And then I remembered that I had someone who neither slumbers nor sleep. I have somebody who is not bound by geographical boundaries. The fact that he, he was not in the country, there was a God that I could call on. And therefore I went to Jehovah. One of my favorite verses is Hebrews 4:16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hallelujah, somebody. In those times, you need to know how to pray, not how to speak, not how to uh, carry yourself, not how to dress, but how to pray. Amen. A good marriage may be important, but a good prayer life is most important. Let this enter our spirits. In all you're getting, get prayer. In all your activities, make room for prayer. Amen. Now, as a woman, there are many challenges. I'm sure it's been spoken of by the various speakers. There are challenges of motherhood. As soon as you become a mother, your sleep is compromised. You wake up when the baby says you should wake up. And sometimes you have just gone to bed. So when you hear the baby cry, your heart sings, oh, not again. And then you stumble and you begin to feed the baby. That is even fast forward. I'm talking about pre-baby, you are not going to go into labor for nine months, and during those nine months, it's just going to take God. So if you are going to bring a new baby into this world, surely you must acknowledge God in that. 
God must have a hand in that. And like Daniel, you may not be a prime minister, but you wear many hats. I always say that women are domestic bears because they have to, and nutritionists because they have to figure out what you are going to eat today, tomorrow, now, and forever. And sometimes when you even ask your husband, what would you like to eat today? He will say anything. And then, I don't know. But when you go and bring, say, oh, is there not something else? And meanwhile, you've been on your feet for so long. Amen. The children will keep coming to you for everything. Now, my daughter once brought tree homework. And when she brought me, I don't speak tree so well. I'm fancy. And I don't even know how to read or write that because I wasn't taught that in school. So when she brought it, I also saw that I didn't know anybody. It was a quapim tree. So I said, okay, I will help you. I helped her. And when she came back the next day, mommy, you didn't teach me what I got zero. I got zero. You didn't teach me what. But all that are part of the hearts that we wear. Whenever a child is going through something, it is likely that the child will come to you. When the child gets hurt, you become a nursing and a first aid person. Amen. When you are giving pocket money, you have now become a bezer. You have to now balance to be sure that the money reaches everywhere. Now, as you are wearing all these hats, and then after that, you have to look good for your husband. In the midst of it, you don't have to look like a Bob Marley or that some bomb has fallen in the house. The house must still look together. Even when you have help, you are still the supervisor. You are still the CEO. How are you going to do all these things like Daniel and still find time to pray? The thing is that without prayer, you will break down. Without prayer, you may become a lunatic. Without prayer, your home cannot be normal. Amen. I've learned to pray about everything. Even in my church, when I do a lot of like protocol, decor, serving of food, I pray about everything. The Lord, as we are having this conference, give me ideas, show me how to serve your servants well, help me to know how to give of my best. Because the Bible says, if you give a prophet a glass of water in the name of a prophet, you receive a prophet's reward. How much more rice and stew and grilled pork? Surely, I must be receiving more than that. But I come to him and I say, Lord, help me to give of my best, you know? And I always tell people that I think that I'm one of the weakest people on earth. And so I pray not just to be prayerful, but I pray because Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. And I am a greater testimony to the fact that apart from him, beloved, apart from him, I can do nothing. So we pray because we have so many things to do and so many hearts. Like somebody asked um, the last speaker before me that how do you juggle all this? How do you juggle all this? You juggle by prayer. Prayer is one of the primary things because you, you cast your burden on him. And when you cast your burden, you are free not to be the next patient in Ankerful Mental Hospital, but that God brings you through with a mighty hand. Amen, somebody. You are never too busy, too blessed, or too successful to pray. When you were poor, you didn't have a carpet. You used to pray. Now you have a red carpet in your room. You have air conditioner. You snore, and you have no time to pray. Say, These days, my business has become very hectic. My business, what does the Bible say? When thou art eating, and thou art full, and thou art built goodly houses, then you shall remember the Lord your God. So it's time to come before him and forget not all his benefits through prayer. Amen, somebody. Hmm. Prayer is the source of our power and our protection. Prayer is part. So the next, the point before is, we are never too busy, too blessed, or too successful to pray. And at this time, prayer is a source of our power and protection. You must realize that it is prayer which releases the power of God on your behalf. Jesus knew the power of prayer. That is why he spent long hours in prayer. Maybe you are successful in what you do. 
and you don't think that you need any of this spiritual stuff. But power comes through prayer. And we do not need any other power than when we have the power of prayer. Amen. The last part of the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 18, put on this, put on this, put on this, and then it comes to say, do all this by prayer. So it's not just take the armor, breastplate of righteousness, belt of truth, I'm wearing, I'm wearing. It's good to wear, but it is done through prayer. Amen? And prayer protects us and delivers us. Let me ask you something. If sinless Jesus was very prayerful, he has not committed any sin. No. He was very, very prayerful, always in the Father's presence. Then you, what, man, <laughs> what manner of person would you like to be? You know, John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Threefold vision of Satan, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I came that you may have life, and have it more abundantly. Now, if such a, an entity as Satan has this threefold vision to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and you think that prayer is not important, how are you going to overcome? Because Daniel, many times, Satan used the people around him to want to kill him. Either they put him in a furnace, or they put him among lions. So don't think that because you are successful, or because you know God, you will not go through times of being put through the fire. People would like to eliminate you. Satan would like to eliminate you. But prayer is a protection and a covering in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the home, you protect your home. You protect your children. Amen. You protect even your husband sometimes. <laughs> In Luke chapter 3, verse 21, before Jesus started his ministry, the Bible says that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. He had not healed any sick person. He had just come to be baptized, and he was praying when the heavens were open. So it's not just you have to do some things before. Prayer is what started Jesus' ministry. Prayer is what opened the heavens. He hadn't done any miracles anywhere, but the prayer opened the heavens to him. You too, prayer will bring open heavens. The Christians of today, we do things like the world. We look for help like the world. We want to know somebody. We want, do you know anybody who works at CP? Do you know anybody who works at Tallow Oil? Do you know anybody who works at Cosmos Oil? No, I don't know anybody, but I know him. I know Jehovah. But you never prayed about it. There's financial difficulty in the home. You never prayed about it. You never asked him for it. And you are looking like the world to people who you know, influential people. But the God in heaven is waiting to be kind to you. And prayer gives us protection and provision in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember that Hannah prayed. Amen. Because she was going through a lot with Penina, her, her rival. Now, you would think that in a home like that, the husband will really understand, you know, because he, he can see that as he married Hannah, he has gone to add Penina. I say that because Hannah's name came first in the list of people. And as he has married Penina, you, who came first, you are not having a child. And you are very sad about it. But as if that was not enough, you are in a home where there's problems. And one of your major problems is Penina because when your husband goes to work, you are left with her. And the Bible says she provoked Hannah saw so that she wept and did not eat. Many of us respond to problems in our homes with emotions. It is okay if you are showing your emotion, but it should not end there. But Penina's anguish drove Hannah to the Shiloh temple 
And there she engaged God. And she said, I am a woman of a sor sorrowful spirit. And out of the abundance of my sorrow, have I spoken. Amen. Prayer brought a change in Hannah's situation. Her home was like a war zone. Her husband could not appreciate what she was going through. No human being always appreciates what you are going through. But God, Jesus, he was touched with the feeling of your infirmity. So no matter what storm is raging in that home, you can make it a godly home when you engage Jesus in your Shiloh, in your temple, in your closet. It makes all the difference. Elkanah came and said, Hannah, why are you crying? Why do you cry? Why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Four foolish questions. And am I not better to you than ten sons? You are not. A son is different from a husband. A child is different from a husband. But who is going to understand that? The throne room of grace. A godly home. Sometimes you can't even stay in the house. Things are happening all around you. But prayer changes things. Prayer changes things. And Jesus prayed. Amen. There's, there's no home that is always summer. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. And those of you who are not yet married, who feel that when I do this, he will understand me. When I do this, he gets it. When I do that, he gets my message. Really? Really? The only person who gets your message is your high priest who is touched with the feeling of your infirmities. It's time to kick your prayer. It is by prayer that we sustain what God has placed in our hands. Amen. There's a law of degeneration at work in the world. Everything is decaying. Adrian, how do you know? You don't have to do anything. When you wake up in the morning and you have... He's giving you people to look after. My parents had so many people to look after. We ourselves were a lot already. And they kept adding, even today. My husband is, my mother is 82. Every day, she's bringing people. Oh, hey, you know, so the nifis, then see, fanaba, you know. So, for me, the definition of a home is wider than that. But, in all God kept us, and I believe that my parents did what they knew best to bring us through a godly home. Amen. We pray. Prayer must continue and must be effective. If it's, for prayer to be effective, it must be habitual. Amen. Now, Luke 22, 39. Luke 22, 39. It says that Jesus went to pray as was his habit or as was his custom. Amen. What is you to your custom? Effective prayer must be a habit. Every great person in this life has some good habits. 
An action becomes a habit when it is repeated many times. Sometimes consciously, sometimes unconsciously. It becomes your custom. If you decide to develop a habit of prayer, you are developing a habit for success. Jesus went to pray as was his custom because it was his habit. The Bible tells us that Jesus had customs or habits. Daniel had a custom of praying three times a day. Life in the secular world is not design designed to include a prayer time. Work starts early in the morning and continues late into the night. Weeks may pass before you even think of prayer. For many people, it is only an impossible situation that reminds them of the need to pray for prayer because then God has become a spare tire. But we need to develop our prayer life so that just like we brush our teeth automatically, we bath automatically, prayer will become a habit. But a habit has to be, to form a habit, you have to do something continually before it becomes a habit. So one of the nuggets is that for prayer to be effective, beloved, if we are following the example of Jesus, it has to be habitual. Sometimes you get a particular place that you pray and it makes it habitual. It's like a meeting with God and that gives you time to pray. Amen. The next point, every nation, every home, every country needs lots of prayer and prayerful leaders. Amen. First Timothy 2 verse 1. First Timothy 2 verse 1. You should be able to quote this, right? <laughs> I exhort therefore the first of all, supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks. Okay, let me read from the Amplified. I prefer that. First of all then, I admonish and urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be offered on behalf of all men. Okay, then verse 2. For kings and all who are in positions of authority or high responsibility. For kings and all who are in positions of authority or high responsibility. That we may pass a quiet and undisturbed life. And an inwardly peaceable one. In all godliness and reverence and seriousness in every way. For such praying is good and right. And it is pleasing and acceptable to our God. Amen. Lady Reverend, how does that come in? Well, it says you should pray for kings and all who are in positions of authority. Your husband is in a position of authority over you. Amen, ladies? Your husband is the head of the home. Whether you like it or not, that's why you should be careful who you choose to be your head. Amen, young ladies? Because when the head is fault, the legs and hands and everything will walk in the wrong places. So your head is very important. And the Bible says prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks and supplication be made for those who are in authority. Your husband is in authority over you. In a godly home, he is going to make decisions that will affect you. And some of the decisions, even though you know it will not work well, he will not listen to what you are saying. So, what are you going to do? Then the Bible says, Pray, pray, pray for the person who is in authority over you. Why? So that you will lead a quiet and undisturbed life in your home and in your life. Amen? Quiet. Lady Reverend, I just want some peace around me. Every day, Lady Reverend. Pray for him. He's making financial decisions that are leading you to poverty. Huh? Pray for those who are in authority. And I think that, especially wives, 
are good or should be good at praying for their husbands because you know more what is wrong than everybody else. And you see more what the struggles are, what the difficulties are. And God has called you as a godly woman in a godly home and a godly wife to pray for the person who is on authority over your life. Your boss, yes. Your pastor, yes. But in your home, your direct authority is this man that you have gone to bring. Or he has gone to bring you. <laughs> Amen. You know, Proverbs 21 verse 1 says that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water. And God turns it with us wherever he will. So your husband may be rigid. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. But his heart is in the hands of a greater person. And that person is God. So he said that the king's heart is in God's hand. And God turns it. Amen? So instead of quarreling, da, you are quarreling. Have you not seen that it's not by might nor by power? Have you not seen that your complaining and your grumbling and your criticism is not going anywhere? Why don't you try prayer? Pray for the person who is in, above you because the Bible says the husband is the head of the house. Hey! It says, wives, submit yourselves. Not that somebody should force you to submit or you yourself. And to your own husbands. Amen. Abigail, she saw that the, the first Samuel 25, she saw that the decision her husband neighbor had taken was wrong. But she was a wise woman. So she didn't come to knock on the door. Her neighbor, so you, David, came to you and what did you say? I don't agree with some of these things you do. The man, by the time she had finished speaking, David's army would have been there, would have wiped them out. But she decided, let me just take some figs and some raisins and some wine and all that to David's people and let me ride behind them because a, a man's gift makes room for him. And then when I get there, I'll be able to speak to David. When she got there, it is remarkable. Very remarkable. First Samuel 25 verse 23. First Samuel, some of you have even never heard this story before. <laughs> God should help you. Just a Bible, no word yet. It's only under your pillow. You think that it comes into your head by osmosis. <laughs> 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted and lighted off the ass and fell before David on her face in an attitude of prayer and bowed herself to the ground and fell at his feet. And what did she say? Upon me, my Lord, upon me, let this iniquity be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience and hear the words of thine handmaid. Let not the Lord, my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so he is. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But, you know, what did she do? She said, let the iniquity of Nabal be upon me. That is intercession. When you stand in the gap, when you take the place of the person and you say, David, let the sin of Nabal, my husband, let it be on me so that my household will be saved. And what happened? When Abigail did this, it gave Nabal a few more days to live and it saved the whole household. A godly home can be won through intercession when you stand in the gap. And I was saying that there are things that you know that outsiders will not know as a wife. No, David didn't know that Nabal was a fool. But Abigail said his name is Nabal and it means that he is a fool as his name means. Because that was the only excuse she could use to stop David from advancing on the home. Amen. So the things that she knew she spoke about it in her intercession. She said, upon me, let this iniquity be. Take it that, Lord, take it that I am standing in the gap. Take it that I have done the wrong. Forgive us, cleanse us, and don't use it against us. That is how you build a godly home. It's not by argument. 
It's not by Ntokwa. The women of today say, I'm a woman of the 21st century. It doesn't matter if you are 31st. The things you are using are not working. But the heart of the king is in God's hands. And he turns it with the soever he will. Many people appeared before kings and they didn't know what they were going to say. But the Bible will say that God turned the heart of this king towards Israel. May that be your story too. You make a godly home by interceding for the one who is in authority over you. Every nation, every home needs lots of prayer and prayerful leaders. Husbands and children are also part of what we have and what we should pray about. Amen. If you take Esther, as well, she said, no, I can't help, you know, Mordecai, you, you, you haven't been a big shot before. You don't know some things in the palace. You are a Kubala boy, so you don't know anything. So when we talk about palace protocol, then you just want to. But when Mordecai sent her a message, Esther said, in Esther chapter 4, verse 15 to 17, Esther chapter 4, verse 15 to 17, are you there? Then Esther bade them return Mordecai this answer. Go, gather together all the Jews that are present in Sushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also, not that because I'm, I'm queen, I'm not adding myself to the fasting and prayer. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law. And if I perish, I perish. How many of you know that? Because her maidens fasted with her. And because she sent Mordecai to also go and rally prayer. The Jews were saved. She prayed. She said, go and fast for me. And my maidens and I will also fast. The heart of the king is in God's hands. This was a place where the Jews were going to be killed. They didn't even have a say. They were not important. And Haman was reigning supreme. Everything he told the king, the king did. But God, by prayer, changed things. <clears throat> also in the home, there was a problem. For 30 days, he lives with the man. She has not seen the man. And she doesn't know whether she can go into his presence. But prayer changed all that. No matter how terrible the protocol in your home is, prayer can make all the difference. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, somebody. Amen. Prayer in the home to build a godly home is important because we are always taking decisions. We are always taking decisions. You know, your ways acknowledge him. Should my child go to this school? Or should he go? You say, oh, this school is a good school, so he should go there. Who said? There may be an agent of Satan there waiting to convert your child. God knows everything. So you know your ways. I've learned to come to God. Say, God, my son, my daughter wants to do this course. And the decision is that he should go here. But Lord, I want to know, direct my path. What is your will? What is your way? What do you want us to do? Because Jesus, before he chose his disciples, he continued all night in prayer and still one was a devil. Amen. Somebody said for every 12 people, there's one devil. Because the 12 disciples. But if the son of God, before making a decision, would pray, why is it that you, before making a decision, you will not pray? Amen? In a godly home, decisions are taken by submitting them to God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, not as many as are led by their feelings, as many as are led by what is popular. I will need you to give me time. Whatever. As many as are popular. As many, no. If the Son of God took a decision by prayer, you too, you are going to do a business, you won't pray. Your daughter has met somebody. You won't pray. So, boy, really? 
Really? Do you know what is under that uh, uh, smart suit? Huh? He said, well, his father has money. They are very successful. So it's a good marriage. They should marry. Really? Decisions, choices should be subject to God in that in prayer. God should have the first word and the last word in our homes. Amen. The young people, these days you don't pray about anything. You just look on Instagram. <laughs> He's a fine man. Really? <laughs> you go and marry a fine man. He will give you fine slaps. <laughs> Amen. But you should come to the place where you say, Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I like him. He looks fine. He looks proper. But Lord, nevertheless, not my will, but yours. Because you can see into the future. You can see through all of us, Lord. Direct me. The Bible says, in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. Therefore, if you don't acknowledge him, how can he direct? He cannot direct. What your children to, should do, the problem with this child, how to solve it, the difficulty with this child. Look, even almighty God, he is perfect too. But he had two rebellious children. How did that happen? How did almighty perfect God have Adam and Eve? Huh? So we say, oh, if they had looked after their child, well, you know, if, look, it's by grace. It's by grace. You know your ways. Acknowledge it. Decisions in the home. Choices. Shall we go left or shall we go right? Building a godly home is submitting your decisions and your choices to God in prayer. Amen. You put all your capital together. You say you are going to open a business. The business you were opening was a comm center. And God knew that in, in five years or in one year, comm center will be gone. You too, you are feeling very good at comm center. People will come there to make calls. No more. As soon as you finish the shop, mobile phones came. You didn't hear from him. And that has brought financial problems to the state and to the home. May the Lord deliver you. <laughs> we have to also learn to pray long prayers. There are short prayers and there are long prayers. Matthew 26. From verse 19. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. And he cometh unto the disciples and he found them asleep. And he said unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me for one hour? It means that one hour is standard to Jesus. Amen? He was shocked that Peter them could not pray for one hour. Peter and Co. Could not pray for one hour. He said, what? What a surprise. What? Could you not pray? And he went and came three times. So three hours, they were asleep. And why did he want them to pray? He said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Temptations. Temptations to divorce. Temptations to be separated. Temptation to pack out. Amen? Temptation to insult. Temptation to slap. Nowadays, the girls that have come, they slap people. They slap men. <laughs> Amen? But... If they had prayed, maybe uh, Peter would not have denied Jesus because Jesus said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Pray therefore. Amen. We must all develop the ability to pray. And the best way to swim is to fall in the water. In the same way, the best way to know how to pray is to begin to pray. Amen. And then finally, in building a godly home, we pray because we ourselves how to mature and have to build ourselves up. Jude chapter 21. But you, beloved, building up yourselves 
not somebody doing it for you. Building up yourselves in your most holy faith, praying in the spirit. When you speak in tongues, you are building up yourself. As a woman, as a child, as a husband, whatever your role is in the home, you need muscle and strength to survive and to prevail. And the Bible is saying, you also build up yourselves. It's like a muscle. It's like how you go to the gym. Build up yourself in your most holy faith. How? Praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit. Praying in the spirit. Amen, ladies. Don't build up yourself only on makeup. I met a young lady who was talking to me and she told me, hey, me dear, me kwa sorry na me draw my eyebrows up. Hey, one hour. Because I didn't know. I said me yeah, yeah. And I said, Oh, that's nice. Now Bible swear. What kind for how long? <laughs> oh madam. When the storms of life are hitting you, your mascara will not stand. Your blush will not stand. Your primer will not stand. Your foundation will not stand. But if you build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the spirit, God will sustain you. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. I've come across a lot of impossible situations. And like I told you, sometimes my husband is a crusade, he's here, he's here. Impossible situations. Sometimes it may even be my own personal challenge. It's not easy for a pastor's wife because a church has many, many different types of fish. Jesus said the kingdom of God is made up. Some of you are red, blue, green. Hey, when you manifest, it's not easy. <laughs> and sometimes there's no one to talk to, no one who understands or no one who... What do you do? But I have learned to find a friend in Jesus. Sometimes you see me pacing up and down in my room and saying, even today, oh God, remember me. Oh God, I cannot travel all this way to this child, but you can send angels. You can go ahead of me. You can make a difference. God, I don't know what to do, but your word says that you perfect everything that concerns me. Prayer is not always about problems. Prayer is also just loving him. Prayer is just building an altar to his name. Prayer is reminding yourself of all his benefits. Amen. And all that builds a godly home. Your children will see you praying. You will teach them to pray. Not by what you say only, but by example. They'll see you. Sometimes they'll come to your room and they'll see you weeping. You are kneeling by your bed and you are praying. You are building a godly home. It's speaking volumes to them. Woman of God, child of God, build a godly home through prayer. Don't wait till you get married. Start before. Start before. Even I've told some women, you know, when you are lying by your husband, behave as if it's just romantic. You are passing your hand through his hair, but you are actually praying. Eradicate sand, why? Eradicate chain, why? Eradi move, why? And God will do it. So by prayer, we can build so much and build an edifice. When you educate a child and you, uh, a woman, you educate a nation. So when you teach children to pray and to be godly, it will affect the nation at large and things will be different because prayer will change things. Stand to your feet, please. What a friend we have in Jesus All our sins and griefs to bear Oh, what a friend You can change the key if it's to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace. Oh, what peace. We often forfeit. Oh, 
I have received new life in Jesus Christ. I embrace a new beginning. Walk with me, God. Strengthen me, God. And keep me on this path for your name's sake. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand up. Any books? I brought some books for you. God bless you. To establish you, please don't go collect your book. God bless you. God bless you. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Talk to God about your prayer life. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I'm just taking my seat. Talk to God about your prayer life. You've heard everything. Talk to him about what you want him to do. Tell him you want to build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the spirit. Father, we ask for the grace to pray. Deliver us from deception. Deliver us from worldly comforts. Deliver us from the comforts of sleep, the comforts of television, the comforts of internet, the things that distract us from prayer. Deliver us from all the snares and machinations of, the, of Satan. And Father, set us free to seek you in prayer, to know you in prayer, to achieve great things in prayer. For your word says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by your spirit. Let the spirits of prayer, the anointing for prayer, the grace for prayer be released unto your people. And let us see godly homes, godly lives, and godly institutions established. I leave your blessing with your people. Let them be strong in prayer. Let them work strong. For they that know their God shall work strong and do exploits. Let there be exploits in their prayer life. And do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Bless them, Lord, with no sorrow added. Let this day be a transformation in our prayer lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.